I never imagined my life would take such a drastic turn. Growing up, I believed family was unbreakable, a constant in a world full of uncertainties. I pictured a simple life, working hard, raising kids who admired me. But life doesn't always go as planned. My marriage started falling apart and I didn't see the signs. By the time I realized I'd been deceived by the person I trusted most, it was too late. Looking back, it's surreal how quickly things fell apart. Carrie and I once seemed happy, building a life together, making plans for a bigger house after Jimmy was born. But I was too caught up in work to notice the cracks. When I finally did, Carrie had already decided to leave, and I was left to pick up the pieces. Sitting by the bay window, I watched neighborhood kids play. I spotted Jimmy, my son, joining their game, flashing me a smile. That brief moment was all I had left of being part of his life. If Carrie knew he was near me, she'd drag him home, but Jimmy always found a way to wave at me. It hit me hard. My son, only ten, old enough to understand what happened between his mom, me, and Greg. The hardest part was how Carrie told me she was leaving. It was an ordinary Tuesday. Jim, I'm pregnant, she said. I hugged her, happy, until I noticed she was crying. She wasn't hugging me back. Then she told me, It's not yours. I'm moving in with Greg Allen. Shocked, I left the house went to Greg's and knock him up. He called the cops and I spent the night in jail. Carrie got a restraining order and a week later I got divorce papers. I never even got to ask why she cheated. The game outside ended and Jimmy blew me a kiss. I pointed to the mailbox where I'd left a phone for him. He wasn't supposed to have one until he was 12 but I wanted to mess with Carrie. My sister agreed to take the blame. Inside, there was a note. Jimmy, I love you more than anything. You have unlimited data, so you don't need Wi-Fi, and I've left a card for games. All of Billy Joel's music is downloaded. Enjoy. I'm sorry I messed up, but I miss you every day. My number is saved as Mike. You can text me, but don't call me, buddy. This is how it has to be for now. I love you. Jimmy smiled, crumpled the note, and grabbed the phone. I love you, he yelled, running off. Billy Joel was our thing. Jimmy pretended to hate his music, but I knew he liked it. He'd sneak in song lyrics to see if I'd notice. One time after getting a D on a test, Carrie said, You're a straight A student. Without missing a beat, Jimmy replied, I guess I think too much, quoting Billy Joel. I laughed, but Carrie didn't get the joke. It was our thing. I worked as a mechanic for a construction company, fixing everything from cars to cranes since high school. It paid well and I had a winter vacation every year. Carrie was a teacher and we met at a country bar. We hit it off and three years later we got married. We bought a small house, planning to move up eventually. But, in Carrie's version of moving up, I didn't fit. I didn't know she was cheating until she told me she was pregnant with Greg's baby. Greg was disliked by most, tolerated only because he brought expensive whiskey to parties. Somehow, Carrie was the exception, needing more than what I could provide, despite my stable union job with benefits. Carrie never complained about money. We took trips and she bought whatever she wanted, so I was shocked when she started looking down on my job, calling me a grease monkey. The first time was after I got dirt on her shirt, and from then on, it became her go-to insult. After Carrie moved in with Greg, our divorce was finalized. I gave Jimmy a secret phone to stay in touch, even though there was a restraining order. I violated it once at a barbecue when Greg made a crude remark about Carrie's pregnancy, and I kicked him. Luckily, neighbors backed me up, and I avoided arrest though the incident kept the restraining order in place. A month after giving Jimmy the phone, we texted daily, keeping things casual, never mentioning that I was his dad. One night, Jimmy called in a panic. Greg had strike Carrie and pushed him. Without thinking, I rushed to their house, ignoring the restraining order. I kicked in the door and saw Greg going after Jimmy while Carrie struggled on the floor. I shoved Greg outside, knocking him down the steps. Jimmy, call emergency, I shouted. Carrie tried to talk to me, but I cut her off, telling her to focus on Jimmy. As I walked away, I remembered I wasn't supposed to be there. But before I left, I kicked Greg in the balls again, something I was starting to enjoy. Trey Jackson, Greg's neighbor, laughed as he watched me while his wife Ziona went inside to help Carrie and Jimmy. Another neighbor kept an eye on Greg. What happened, Jim? Trey asked as I sat down on the grass a little ways from the house. Jimmy called for help, I said. Greg strike Carrie and pushed him, so I ran over. Damn, we heard the screams but didn't know it was that bad. It's all right, I laughed. Didn't even get a chance to knock him, just shoved him out the door. We chuckled until the police and ambulance arrived. Trey offered to explain everything to the cops, reminding them I was staying clear due to the court order. 
We all know you didn't deserve this, Trey added. Thanks, man, I said as the police questioned Trey, the neighbors, and a now awake Greg. One officer cuffed Greg while another waved me over to talk. Are you Jim Spellman? The officer asked. Yes, sir. I explained what happened while the ambulance left, taking Carrie on a stretcher and Jimmy with a bandage on his forehead. Is my son okay? I asked. They're checking for a concussion, but he seems all right, the officer replied before continuing. We might need to take you in for violating the restraining order. I had to help Jimmy, I said. Screw that order. He stepped away to check his radio, then returned. Your ex-wife didn't want to address the order violation, so you're free for now, but it could change if Greg presses charges. I went home hoping Jimmy was okay, and briefly wondered if Carrie was too, but I pushed that thought aside. The next day, I called my lawyer, who advised me to avoid contact with Carrie or Jimmy. Later, my mom confirmed they were fine. Carrie had stayed in the hospital, and Jimmy was with her parents. A few days later, my lawyer called to tell me Greg was denied bail, likely because Carrie was pregnant and Jimmy was hurt. Surprisingly, Carrie's lawyer filed to lift the protective order. A court date was set, and I couldn't wait to see Jimmy. In the following weeks, Carrie called me several times, but I didn't answer to avoid jeopardizing the case. On court day, I cleaned up, bought a new suit, and shaved, wanting to make a good impression. The judge was thorough, asking tough questions about why I could see Jimmy now, but not before. After everything was explained, she rescinded the order. As we left the courtroom, Carrie approached me. Thank you for coming that night. If you hadn't, I don't think the police would have made it in time. Greg would have eliminated me. I wouldn't let my son get hurt, I said. She began to cry. It's all my fault. He wouldn't have been hurt if it wasn't for me. My lawyer approached, congratulating me on being able to see Jimmy again. Walking out of the courthouse, I felt like I was floating, and then I heard Jimmy yell, Daddy! I turned around and Jimmy was already jumping out of Carrie's dad's truck, running into my arms. I hugged him tightly until he asked me to let him breathe. Dan, Carrie's dad, came over. Sorry I'm late, traffic was bad, he said. No problem, I'm just glad you brought him. Where's Carrie, I asked. She ran off after court, I think she's gone. Dan added, why don't you take Jimmy for the day? Maybe we can have dinner and catch up. I hesitated. We don't have a visitation schedule yet and she might... She doesn't mind, I heard behind me. I turned to see Carrie, tears running down her face. Spend some time together, she said softly. He can even stay the night if you want. Jimmy eagerly asked, may I? Carrie nodded, and I thanked her, feeling a pang of sympathy for her, though I wasn't sure why. Despite everything, part of me still cared. With Jimmy out of school for summer, I took time off work to be with him. Carrie had moved back in with her parents after leaving Greg. One day, when she went into labor, I asked if Jimmy could stay with me longer. Her mom brought him over, and later, I got a call from Dan. Jim, she had a baby girl. You should come see her. I don't care about her baby, Dan. Shut up and come. It's important, he insisted. Reluctantly, I took Jimmy to the hospital. He wanted to buy a teddy bear for his new sister, and I let him, even though I was still bitter. When we arrived, Dan and Jane greeted us, and I learned Carrie had named the baby Allison, after my mom. I walked down the hospital hall and heard Carrie singing a lullaby she used to sing to Jimmy. It hit me hard. Entering the room, I was shocked to see the baby had bright red hair, just like mine. Greg didn't have red hair, but I did. Carrie tearfully said, I think I made a mistake, Jim. I couldn't deal with it and walked out. Back in the waiting area, Jane said, She's yours, Jim. You can see that. Prove it, I replied. Dan explained, That's why you're here. They've ordered a DNA test. You just need to give a sample. I shook my head. It won't change anything. She broke my heart. Three days later, Jimmy asked, Can we visit Allison today? I hesitated, but he added, You don't have to come. Just drop me off at Grandpa's. I agreed. Then he asked, Allison has red hair. Does that mean she's your daughter? I'll know soon, I said. The test results should come today or Monday. Jimmy looked sad, then asked, If she's your daughter, will you love her? I love you, and if she's mine, I'll love her too. He paused, then asked, What about mom? Will you love her? I laughed, pouring more coffee. Your mom will love Allison either way. Without thinking, I said, Your mom hurt me, Jimmy. She caused the worst pain a wife can give a husband. She got pregnant and left me for someone else. The love I had for her is gone. Jimmy was quiet before admitting, That wasn't the first time Greg hurt mom. I was shocked. What do you mean? 
I've heard him slap her before, and they yelled a lot, he said, voice trembling. A tear rolled down his cheek. I hugged him tightly. I'm so sorry, son. I didn't know. Mom told him he wasn't half the man you are, Jimmy added. I let go and we sat down. She didn't want to be married to a mechanic anymore. She wanted more, a bigger house, fancy cars. That's silly, Jimmy said, making me laugh. Yeah, buddy, adults make stupid choices sometimes, he smirked. Don't forget your second win, Dad. I raised an eyebrow. What? You'll figure it out, he said, running off to get dressed. Later, we headed to Carrie's parents' house. Jane answered the door, holding baby Allison. Hey, Jim, any news from the doctor yet? No, I replied, avoiding looking too closely at the baby. Jimmy asked eagerly, Can I hold her, Grandma? Of course, but sit down first. Babies are fragile, Jane said, smiling. Jimmy's excitement was obvious. Jane invited me in for coffee, but I declined. I didn't want to be around Carrie or the baby until I got the DNA results. Just then, my phone rang. It was the lab. Mr. Spellman, we've confirmed a positive DNA match. I hung up before they finished. Sitting on the porch swing, I stared blankly. Carrie had been pregnant with my child when she left me for Greg. I felt like I couldn't breathe. After a while, Dan came over. Are you okay, Jim? I'll never be okay, I replied. How could she do this to me? I loved her. Dan sat beside me in silence. Eventually, he asked, Was that the lab? Yes, I said, avoiding the truth. I wasn't ready to admit I had a daughter. Dan put a hand on my shoulder. Jim, it's obvious. Did you really need the test? I snapped. Yes, how could I trust that promiscuous you raised? I regretted it immediately. I'm sorry, Dan, I didn't mean it. Dan sighed. I know you're hurting. It broke my heart when you two broke up. I love you like a son. I know, Dan. I'm just angry. She was pregnant with my baby when she left me for Greg. I don't know what to do. Dan hugged me. Call your parents. They need to meet their granddaughter. I will, I said, stepping back. But I can't stay. I can't face Carrie after what she's done. Dan slapped me lightly. That little girl has a father. You. Don't forget that. I nodded. You're right. I'm just in shock. Dan softened. Take your time, but you'll have to face it eventually. Call your parents. I called my mom. Hey mom, can you and dad come over for lunch? Turns out Carrie's baby is your granddaughter. What? We'll be right there. After the call, I asked Dan, Can I hold her? Dan smiled. Of course, I'll get her and Jimmy. I sat back on the swing, feeling anxious and ready to leave when Jane appeared, carrying Allison. She handed her to me, and as soon as I held her, my heart melted. She was sound asleep. Jimmy came running out, excited. Isn't she pretty, Daddy? She could be Batgirl for Halloween, I laughed. She sure could. You could be Batman, and she could be Batgirl, or Poison Ivy. Allison woke up crying and Jane stepped forward. Looks like she's hungry. Carrie appeared at the door. I'll take her. She's bosom feeding and I haven't pumped a bottle yet. I kissed Allison's forehead and handed her over. Just as I was about to leave, my parents arrived. My mom rushed over, tears in her eyes. She's feeding, Jane said, hugging her. Come meet her. My dad chuckled. Your mom's been crying since we got off the phone with you, Jim. As they walked inside, my dad asked, well, Jim, do you think everything will work out? I honestly don't know, Dad. Back at home, I tried focusing on yard work, but I couldn't stop thinking about Allison. Knowing she was mine changed everything. I realized I needed to talk to my lawyer about visitation for both kids, not just Jimmy. I'd need to pay more child support, but I didn't mind. After mowing the lawn, I went inside and started thinking about re-childproofing the house. I'd saved the baby gates and crib from when Jimmy was little. It dawned on me that I might need a bigger house. There wasn't room for Allison and Jimmy to share a space. As I cleaned up, I was amazed at how messy the house had gotten since Jimmy had returned. But cleaning felt good. I had just settled on the patio with a beer when I heard my dad and Dan coming around the corner. Want a beer? I asked, handing them bottles. Dad laughed. We're not here for a heavy conversation, are we? Something like that, I muttered. Dan said, Jim, you've been through a lot. You've gone from being separated from Jimmy to finding out you're a father of two. Most men wouldn't handle it as well as you have. My dad got serious. Jim, you're going to be this little girl's father, no matter what. I nodded, but I could tell he was building up to something. Have you thought about your relationship with Carrie? He asked. I laughed, loud and bitter. There is no relationship, Dad. She left me for Greg. 
You think I'm just going to take her back like nothing happened? Are you out of your mind? Jim, it's not that simple, Dan said, trying to defend his daughter. Not a chance, Dan, I snapped. She thought Allison was Greg's, and that's why she went to him. Dan took a deep breath. She didn't know, Jim, if she had known. Are you serious? I yelled. How could she even let there be a question of whose child it was? She cheated on me, broke my heart, and threw it all away. Just because Allison is mine doesn't change that. We understand you're angry, my dad said gently. You don't understand anything, I shot back. She wanted the lifestyle Greg offered, the fancy car, the vacations. She made her choice. Now she can't just come crawling back because things didn't work out with him. I stormed into the house, locking the door behind me. I hated yelling at Dan and my dad, but I couldn't take it anymore. The conversation was over. Time passed without any word from Carrie or her parents. It was almost lunchtime, and I debated whether to call or just pick up Jimmy. I didn't feel like going there, especially not to face Carrie. Then a text from Jane came through. We're taking Jimmy to Red Robin for dinner. You can join us and take him home from there. I figured Carrie and the baby wouldn't be there. Who takes a newborn out to dinner? So, I decided to go. Jimmy would help keep things light. When I arrived, they were enjoying a tower of onion rings, which made me smile. Jimmy always insisted on onion rings when we went out as a family. Hey guys, I greeted sitting down. Dinner went smoothly until after we ate. Dad, Jimmy said, we need a bigger house. I laughed. I agree. You and your sister won't be able to share a room when you visit. No, I mean so mom and Allison can live with us again. I don't want to go back to Greg's house. You're not going back there, I assured him. Greg's going to jail. Jimmy grinned. Thank God, I miss my old room. Dan frowned. Jimmy, your mom, Allison, and you will stay with us for now, and she'll find a new place soon. Jimmy wasn't satisfied. I want to stay with Dad. Why can't I? I tried to stay calm. It's complicated. The judge gave custody to your mom. I'm lucky she's letting you stay with me these last few days. That's not fair, Jimmy cried. Why do I have to suffer? I glanced at Dan and Jane, but they avoided my eyes. Jimmy, it's not fair to me either, I said quietly. One day I had a family, and the next, I lost it all. Your mom told me she was pregnant with Greg's baby, and it broke me. She made a mistake, Dad. She deserves a second chance. I shook my head. Jimmy, that song isn't about giving second chances. It's about not giving up, and this is different. You're giving up, Jimmy yelled. You're not even trying, I took his hand. Son, I loved your mom, but she made her choice, and I can't take her back, Dan stepped in. I think we should call it a day. It's been long for everyone. I agreed and we left the restaurant. The ride home was quiet, but I could tell Jimmy was still upset. He longed for our family to be together again, and we had this conversation almost daily. His tone softened over time, but the sadness never left his eyes. Ten days after Allison was born, Carrie showed up at my door. Hi, Jim. Can I come in? She asked. I called for Jimmy, who ran in and hugged her. Hi, Mom. Where's Allison? She's with Grandma and Grandpa Spellman. She smiled. Oh, good. He ran off, leaving us alone. Are you here to take him home? I asked, bracing for it. No, Jim, I'm here to talk. I frowned, but led her to the living room. Can I get you something to drink? I offered awkwardly. No, thanks, she replied, sitting down. I never got to talk to you before the divorce. Because of that restraining order? I snapped. The one Greg pushed for? She looked down. That was Greg's idea. He wanted revenge. For what? For me knocking him up after he took my family? I asked, anger rising. I know, she whispered. And you didn't need to bring him to that barbecue, I added. Maybe not, she admitted. But you didn't need to kick him either. I only kicked him after he called me a slit in front of Jimmy, I said. You knew I'd be there, Carrie. You knew. Carrie looked away, guilt in her eyes. You know, Greg was in bad shape after that. You probably hurt him more than you realize. I couldn't help but laugh, hard. The idea that I hurt Greg more than he hurt me by taking my wife and ruining my life was absurd. Once I calmed down, I asked, Just get to the point, Carrie. What do you want? She sighed. I... I never stopped loving you, Jim. I froze. What? I was stupid. I made a mistake with Greg. I convinced myself I had to be with him because I thought the baby was his. I didn't even consider that Allison could be yours, she said, wiping a tear. So you just left me without even talking to me? I asked. She nodded. I thought it was the only option. Greg convinced me we'd be good together. I didn't realize how wrong I was until it was too late. 
I paced. You threw everything away, Carrie. We had a family. We were happy. I know, she whispered, voice breaking. I messed up. You did more than mess up. You took my son, slapped a restraining order on me, and now you want a second chance? She started crying again. I'm sorry, Jim. I know I don't deserve it, but I'm asking for another chance, for Allison and Jimmy. I shook my head. Carrie, we can't just go back to how things were. You broke my heart. We can be friends, but I can't take you back. She nodded sadly. I understand. I'm sorry for everything, Jim. She left with Jimmy. That night, I sat by the window, reflecting on how my life had turned upside down. I should have been content with having Jimmy back. But things were more complicated now with Allison. I loved her the moment I saw her, but Carrie asking for a second chance threw everything into chaos. My lawyer had already drawn up a visitation schedule and new child support agreement for both kids. But I worried Carrie might not cooperate. Her request for a second chance was the only leverage I had, and I had just shut it down. Later, Jimmy came home and asked if he could stay with me instead of going back to his grandparents. I explained that the custody arrangement gave him to his mom and there was nothing I could do. What about Allison? He asked. We'll sort that out soon. I want to see her as much as I can, just like I missed you. Jimmy then shifted to dinner, asking for pizza. He even suggested taking Carrie and Allison along, but I shook my head. I know what you're trying to do, Jimmy. It's not going to happen. Mom and I will never be together again. He shrugged and ran off. Later, I took him to Dan's house and asked to see Allison. Dan led me to the room where Carrie was rocking the baby. I whispered that I just wanted to see her for a moment. Carrie replied coldly, Take a good look because soon you won't see her again. What? I asked, alarmed. It's simple, she said. If you don't give me a second chance, I'll fight to make sure you never see Allison or Jimmy again. Just as I was about to yell, Dan placed a hand on my shoulder. Don't say anything you'll regret or she can use against you. I'm a witness here and I won't let her do this. I'll find the best father's rights attorney and we'll fight her all the way. Carrie stood up furious. If you keep getting in the way of my family, I'll cut you out of my life and you'll never see your grandkids again. Jane stormed in, livid. I heard everything on the baby monitor. Carrie, you can't blackmail Jim into taking you back. Don't start a fight you've already lost. Dan suggested moving the discussion to the kitchen, sensing I was about to explode. They left, giving me a moment alone with Allison. As I held her tiny hand, I almost cried, unable to imagine life without her. In the kitchen, I overheard Dan and Jane scolding Carrie. Dan reassured me. You're not alone, Jim. We'll fight this. I turned to Carrie. You made your choice. You divorced me. You have to live with that. Tearing up, she said. I made a mistake. We can rebuild our family if you forgive me. Carrie, the mistake was your affair that led to our divorce. She snapped. If you hadn't been working so much and ignoring me, I wouldn't have ended up with Greg. You barely spent time with me. I was stunned. Instead of talking to me, you ran to the guy next door. You left me thinking the baby was his. She turned away, but I pressed on. You took my son, filed a restraining order because Greg told you to, and now you want to take my daughter too? We need to get along for the kids, but I can't take you back. Carrie broke down, and Jane comforted her. I waved goodbye, feeling exhausted. I hoped Carrie would do the right thing, but I knew I needed to call my lawyer on Monday. I cracked open a beer and realized it was time to move on. It was clear I wasn't going to get back with Carrie, blackmail or not. I needed to get back into dating. Having not dated in over a decade, I knew it would be a challenge, but I decided to go for it. After showering and ordering an Uber, I stared at my outdated wardrobe. I called my sister, who had always helped me pick out clothes before Carrie came along. I threw on some khaki shorts and a golf shirt, ironically an outfit Carrie had bought for me. Looking in the mirror, I realized I was in good shape, had a full head of hair, and my stubble gave me a rugged look. With a stable job and money in the bank, I felt like a good catch. I decided to head to a local sports bar, figuring it was a safer bet than a club. At the bar, I ran into some old friends, Jack, Allen, and Chris. Holy crap! Jack shouted as he saw me, drawing attention. We hugged, and I felt a sense of camaraderie I had missed. Marriage and kids had made it hard to stay close with these single guys, but now things had changed. What's up, guys? I asked, signaling the waitress for a drink. Same old, Chris said. Heard you got divorced, Jim. I nodded as the waitress brought my glass. Yeah, she tried to switch things up and leave me, but now she wants me back. They all laughed, and Jack said, So you're out here looking for a replacement before she hooks you again. Smart move. I chuckled. No, 
I'm not going back, but I figure it's time to get out again. Alan smirked. Maddie's single now. Steve cheated, and she kicked him out last year. No way, I said, surprised. Maddie Ross was one of the high school eight girls everyone had a crush on. She's here, Jack said, nodding toward the bar. She's playing trivia with Heather Scott. I spotted her, still gorgeous, black hair framing her face perfectly. I thought about going over to say hello, but wasn't sure what to say. Jack must have sensed my hesitation. Let's go play trivia and grab a table near them, he suggested, and before I knew it, we were sitting close by. I ordered a pitcher for their table. The waitress smirked and said, Good luck, making everyone laugh at my attempt to impress. I watched as the waitress delivered the drinks. Maddie smiled politely, while Heather whispered something to her. The guys started pushing me to go talk to them. Nervously, I stood up and made my way over, sweating and feeling like a teenager again. Heather saved me from saying something dumb. Jim Spellman, if you buy drinks, you should deliver them yourself, she teased. I smiled sheepishly. I wasn't sure you'd remember me. Of course we remember you, Heather said laughing. I thought you were married. I raised my left hand. Divorced six months ago. Sorry to hear that, Heather said while Maddie straightened up a bit. I noticed Heather's ring. You're married? Yep, five years now. I married Kevin Carlson and we have twin girls. I've got a ten-year-old son and a newborn daughter, I replied. A newborn? Maddie asked, surprised. Yeah, she was pregnant with my child when she left me for someone else. Maddie looked stunned while Heather said, That's quite a story. I smiled. Maybe one for another time. Trivia's starting, right? Maddie nodded. We never miss it. Want to join us? I hesitated. I came with some friends, but I'll check in on them. As I walked back to my table, Jack joked, Go get it, tiger, making everyone laugh. I glanced back at Maddie and Heather, who seemed to be arguing. Taking a chance, I returned and sat down. Miss me? I asked, making them both smile. We're counting on you not to choke, Maddie teased. I'll do my best, I replied. Hours later, we were two points ahead of another team. The host asked the final question. This 1977 album contains the hits She's Always a Woman and Just the Way You Are. I laughed while the ladies looked confused. I scribbled The Stranger on a slip of paper and handed it to the host. Feeling confident, I winked at the professors on my way back. That was the easiest question all night, I said, sipping my beer. Maybe for you, Maddie replied, shaking her head. I don't even know those songs. Heather laughed. At least I know they're Billy Joel songs, one of my favorite albums, actually. When the host announced we won, we all cheered, celebrating our grand prize, a $1.50 bar gift certificate. I let the ladies take it for their tab. Time for me to turn into a pumpkin, Maddie said, smiling. Babysitter's calling. I stood up and asked, can I walk you out? Both smiled and said, please. As we walked, Maddie took my hand and her eyes sparkled. I felt on top of the world. At the car, I kissed her hand and asked, can I get your number? It'd be my pleasure, she said, entering her number into my phone. We made plans for dinner on Saturday and trivia afterward. Heather laughed, I'm still coming. We all laughed, and I kissed Maddie on the cheek before saying goodnight. Monday morning, I called my lawyer to inform him of Carrie's threats. He reassured me. Don't worry, her lawyer faxed over the signed agreement. Joint custody is set. Congratulations. That evening, I was surprised to find Carrie sitting on the steps with Jimmy and Allison. What's this about? I asked, noticing the casserole dish. I brought dinner to help with Jimmy, she said. Tuna casserole, your favorite. I smiled cautiously. I've missed this. I can never make it the same. She sighed. I should have called to offer. Oh, wait. I guess you couldn't have called me. After dinner, Carrie sent Jimmy to his room and handed Allison to me. As I held her, I marveled at how much I'd missed. Carrie looked hesitant. I agreed to the visitation and child support, she said quietly. And what about you'll never see your kids again? I asked, recalling her earlier threat. I overreacted, she admitted. I was desperate to get you back. I sighed. I wish you'd treated me this way before you left. Now it feels like you don't want me. You need me. I can't trust you anymore. Tears welled in her eyes, but I continued. Let's at least stay friends for Jimmy's sake. He doesn't understand what happened. You cheated on me, left me, and got a restraining order because your lover told you to. I was never a danger to you or Jimmy. Jim, I... Don't apologize, Carrie. You didn't give me a chance to fix things. You just fell for him. Tears streamed down her face as she sat there in silence. Allison stirred briefly, and I gently rocked her back to sleep. 
Carrie, you had a choice, him or me. You chose him. You'll never convince me you weren't trying to change your life. I can't believe that. I'm sorry, she whispered. I'm sorry for everything. You'll never know how sorry I am. Can we at least try to make it work for the kids? I leaned back, relieved Allison was finally asleep in my arms. We can be friends, Carrie, but I'm never taking you back. She nodded, her eyes still wet with tears. I know. After Carrie and the kids left, I texted Maddie. Hi, just didn't want you to forget about me. Looking forward to Saturday. When she didn't reply right away, I found myself pacing around the house, checking my phone every few seconds. I started worrying I'd texted her too soon. Dating again felt new, and I wasn't sure of the rules. Should I have waited longer? What if she didn't respond? Was it a bad sign she hadn't introduced me to her kids yet? My mind raced with questions, and we hadn't even had our first date yet. Ten long minutes later, my phone finally rang. A wave of relief washed over me when I saw it was Maddie. Hi, Maddie. Hi, handsome, she said teasingly. I don't really like texting. I prefer talking. Oh, sorry about that. What are you up to? She asked. Just giving my baby girl a bath, the youngest one. I knew you had an older child, but I didn't know about the little one. Yeah, I've got two. Jimmy's ten and Allison's a newborn. Three kids won't scare you, right? She asked with a hint of concern. I laughed. No, I love kids. You know I've got two of my own. Yeah, our older ones go to school together. Really? That's awesome. I don't remember seeing you at any events. I had a terrible schedule before, working second shift at the hospital. I just switched to first shift recently. Huh. Yeah, I remember you mentioning you're a CNA. Mm, yes. That's part of what ruined my marriage, she sighed. Well, actually, my cheating ex-husband did, but he blamed it on my job. Sorry to hear that. Sounds a bit like what my wife used to say. How I worked too much, was too tired, the usual. We both laughed for a moment. That's all crap, Maddie said. They cheat, and then they blame everything but themselves, she continued. They justify it and hurt everyone around them. You know how many chances I had to cheat but didn't? I couldn't do that to my partner. But cheaters, they don't care. Yeah, I sighed. Carrie still tries to win me back. I've got her, my son, and even her parents turning on me. I think they finally see I'm the sufferer here. We are the sufferers, Jim. You haven't done therapy yet, have you? No, I admitted. Have you? Yeah, it helped a lot. I'll give you my therapist's name. He helped me move past the wow, that's me phase. You're still in it. You're way ahead of me. At least you've realized you need to move on. For so long, I just stayed home feeling trapped until I finally realized I had to start living again. For the kids and for myself. Well, she said, her tone softening. We make a good match. I laughed. That's for sure. I've been looking forward to Saturday ever since you kissed me on the cheek. Oh, shoot, Maddie said suddenly, her tone shifting. I have to go. Something's wrong with my three-year-old. She's crying. No problem. Talk soon, I said, smiling as I hung up. I sat down feeling hopeful. Saturday couldn't come fast enough. When Saturday morning finally came, I called my sister. Hey, Jim, she answered cheerfully. Jenny, do you have time to go shopping with me this morning? I need to update my wardrobe. Oh my god, you have a date, don't you? She teased, laughing. I chuckled. Yeah, I'm going out with Maddie Clark tonight. Maddie Ross? Wow, she's beautiful. I heard Steve really messed her up when he cheated. Called her a witch. That's not true, is it? Don't be stupid, big brother, she said, still laughing. Of course I'm free all day. Let's do lunch at the mall and then shop. Sound good? Sounds great. Let's meet at Red Robin at noon, I suggested. As we sat down at the restaurant, Jenny eyed me curiously. So, Mom is thrilled to be a grandmother again. She's crazy about Allison. She visits her at Jane's all the time. Carrie's dropped her off at her mom's a few times, too. And how are you handling all this? She asked, her tone softening. Better. Carrie's finally stopped fighting, and I'm really enjoying my time with the kids. Jenny nodded as we ordered. So, you're moving on with Maddie? She's always been pretty, but not stuck up like some of the other popular girls from high school. I think you two will be great together. I smiled. It's funny. I went out last week just to see how it felt to be on my own again. I didn't expect to meet someone that night. It's almost overwhelming. I really thought she'd blow me off. Jenny smirked. Just be yourself, Jim. If you try too hard or fake anything, she'll pick up on it and you'll blow it. You're a good guy. Just use that. Thanks, Jenny. I guess I'm nervous because I feel out of practice. What do people even do on dates now? 
She laughed. Jim, Maddie's our age, not in her 20s. Just do what you do with Carrie. Dinner, a movie, maybe a bar with dancing, something low-key. She'll enjoy that. You're right, I agreed. Maybe I'm not as clueless as I thought. Jenny grinned. Oh, you're still clueless, but not completely hopeless. We both laughed, and I shook my head as we kept chatting. That evening, I walked up Maddie's driveway. A boy was playing basketball and tossed the ball my way when he saw me. I had to drop the flowers I was holding to catch it, which made him laugh. I guess you're not into flowers, I joked. The boy chuckled. Are they broken? Mom loves flowers. Roses are tough, I assured him. You're lucky. I'm Jim, by the way. Hi, I'm David. Don't tell Mom I made you drop the flowers. I won't, I said, smiling. Thanks for the heads up. David grinned and waved me in. Come on, I'll tell her you're here. As I stepped inside, I saw the living room set up for a sleepover, pillows and blankets everywhere, and DVDs by the TV. David ran upstairs, and a three-year-old peeked around the corner with a sippy cup. She froze when she saw me, screamed, and ran to the stairs. David came back down, scooping her up. Sorry, he said softly. She doesn't like strangers. You scared her. I waved it off. No worries. My daughter's the same way. At that moment, Maddie came down the stairs, looking stunning in a long skirt and loose blouse. She took the little girl from David and smiled at me. This is David, she said. He goes to school with your son, Jimmy. Jimmy Spellman? David asked. Cool. He ran off, excited by the connection. Maddie touched her middle child's head. This is Samantha, but everyone calls her Sammy. Nice to meet you, Sammy, I said, smiling. And this little one, Maddie continued, nodding to the shy girl in her arms, is Bella. She'll need some time to warm up. She's not a fan of new people, as you can tell. I wiggled my fingers at Bella, but she buried her face in Maddie's chest, still wary. My mom's running a bit late, Maddie explained. She's staying over tonight, so we'll have the evening to ourselves. I nodded, wondering if that meant I wouldn't be going home alone. No rush. We've got time. Want a beer while we wait, or maybe a glass of wine? A beer sounds good, thanks, Maddie said, setting Bella down. The little girl quickly ran upstairs to join her siblings. You've got a lovely family, I said, handing her the beer. Thanks, they're a handful, but they're good kids, she replied, sitting on the couch. I glanced around the room and pulled a pillow closer. One thing I've learned about having kids is no matter how clean you try to keep the house, someone's always making a mess. Maddie laughed. You've got that right. So you and Steve got married, huh? That wasn't a surprise. You two were inseparable in high school. She chuckled. We weren't together out of love. We were part of a friend group and everyone paired off. We just happened to last until graduation. Then when I got pregnant with David, we did what was considered the right thing and got married. It wasn't a rifle wedding, but we were never in love. It was doomed from the start. I nodded, sipping my beer. Before I could respond, Maddie checked her watch. We should probably head out soon. I don't want to be late for our reservation. I smiled. Don't worry, we've got plenty of time. She laughed softly. Jim, you don't need to be nervous. I've been looking forward to this all week. She gave me that bright smile again, the one that made her eyes sparkle, and my heart raced. Me too, I admitted. Honestly, I thought you might change your mind. Not a chance, she replied. Unless you've turned into an idiot since high school, I wasn't going to pass this up. I laughed, relieved. I'm glad you didn't. Just then, the front door opened, and Maddie's mom walked in. Sorry I'm late, she called out, smiling as she entered. No worries, Mom, Maddie replied, standing up. Mom, this is Jim Spellman. We went to school together. Her mom smiled warmly at me. Nice to meet you, Jim. Take care of my favorite daughter or I'll come find you. I chuckled. I thought it was the dad's job to threaten me. Her smile faltered. My John passed away last year. I'm really sorry to hear that, I said softly. She waved her hand dismissively. Don't worry about it. Just have a good time tonight, though. Not too good, she added with a wink, making us both laugh. Maddie kissed her kids goodbye and we headed out. As we left, Maddie's mom chuckled from the doorway. When we arrived at the steakhouse, Maddie and I settled at a table by the window. It seemed perfect for a casual yet meaningful evening. But just as we got comfortable, something unexpected happened. Two tables over sat Dan and Jane, my ex-in-laws. The sight of them made my stomach drop. I wanted to bolt, but Maddie noticed my unease and asked, What's wrong, Jim? I sighed and motioned for her to sit. My in-laws are here, two tables over, I said quietly. She glanced back, and as soon as she did, they spotted us. 
I braced myself for an awkward encounter, but I didn't need to worry. They both smiled and walked over to our table. Hey, Jim, Dan said, clapping me on the back. Good to see you out and about. Who's the hottie? He asked, grinning as Jane held his hand. I smiled awkwardly. Hi, guys. This is Maddie, my date. Maddie, these are my in-laws, Dan and Jane. Jane smiled warmly at Maddie. Maddie, he's a keeper. Don't let him go like my foolish daughter did. Maddie looked startled, wide-eyed like a deer in headlights. Uh, okay. I don't really know what to say, she stammered, clearly taken aback. Dan laughed. Don't say anything. Just enjoy your night. After they left, Maddie let out a breath she didn't realize she was holding. Well, that was... something, she said, half laughing, half surprised. Yeah, they're good people, I said, relaxing. When Carrie tried to scare me into thinking she'd take the kids if I didn't take her back, they set her straight. Maddie raised an eyebrow. Do you really think it was a bluff? Not entirely sure, I admitted. I think it crossed her mind and she said it out of desperation. But I'm not dwelling on it. She signed the custody papers and that's what matters. Maddie squeezed my hand gently. Good. Don't forget what she put you through. But for the kids' sake, get along. They'll sense tension if there's any, but never fully trust her. I nodded, appreciating her advice. When the waitress came over, I decided to do something kind. Can you send a couple of desserts to that table? I asked, gesturing toward Dan and Jane. The waitress smiled, jotting it down. Maddie grinned at me, clearly impressed. We continued our dinner, swapping stories and laughing, and afterward, we headed to the bar for trivia night. When we walked in, Heather was already holding a table, and Jack and the guys were there too, giving me thumbs-ups when they saw Maddie laughing. I couldn't help but feel proud to be with her. Her laugh was infectious. So, where did you two go for dinner? Heather asked curiously. To the chop house, Maddie said. You won't believe it, but his ex-in-laws were there and came over to our table. Heather's eyes widened. Oh no, what did you do? Nothing, Maddie laughed. They were actually really nice. They told me not to lose him like their daughter did. Wow, Heather said, shaking her head. First date of the year, Jim. You ready to defend our title? You bet, I said confidently, glancing at the elderly professors from last week. One of them nodded, and the other mimed a throat slash as if to say I was going down. I smirked, always loving a bit of friendly trash talk. Well, we got lucky with that Billy Joel question last week, Maddie teased, nudging me. No worries, ladies. We've got this. And we did. By the last question, we had a solid 10-point lead. The host tried to throw us off with a 12-point final question, but it was about a country singer Heather loved. She nailed it, securing another win for us. After trivia, we walked Heather to her car. Maddie and I wrapped in each other's arms. She felt so right in my arms, and I didn't want to let her go. It was a perfect night and I hoped there'd be more to come. Good night, guys, Heather said, giving Maddie a hug and surprising me with one, too. Drive safe, sweetie, Maddie called after her as she pulled away. Maddie turned to me, her eyes sparkling again. It's still early, she said playfully. You've got two options. Take me home and we can talk, or we can go to your place and have a little more fun. I wasn't about to mess this up. I took her to my place. Once inside, I offered her a drink. Want some wine? I've got red, white, or beer. White wine would be great, she said, settling on the couch and slipping off her shoes. I grabbed the bottle of Pinot Grigio I'd bought earlier, hoping for this exact moment. Here you go, Mads, my favorite wine for my favorite girl. Mads? she asked with a smirk. What, too soon for a nickname? She laughed, clearly charmed. No, not too soon. My dad used to call me Mads. Oh, I said, feeling a little awkward. I didn't mean to... Stop, she said, smiling warmly. It's fine. My dad would have liked you. I smiled, sitting next to her and slipping my arm around her shoulders in what I hoped was a smooth move. Nice try, Ace, she teased, laughing again. Don't overdo it. I've waited a long time to find someone like you, and now that I have, I'm looking forward to dessert. We kissed, but nothing more happened that night. We waited until the third date to take things to the next level, after a romantic dinner at a fancy place she'd picked. Back at my house, I poured her another glass of wine, and we sat on the couch, talking and laughing like old friends. Later that night, she leaned in close and whispered, Jim, show me your bedroom. As we headed to the bedroom, memories of the past year flooded my mind. The affair, the divorce, losing and regaining my son, Allison's birth. Now I had Maddie too. I knew I wouldn't let her go. We were two broken souls, healing together. It was too soon to think about the long term, but I was certain I wouldn't make the same mistakes.
Maddie and my kids would come first from now on. Work would follow. As I drifted off to sleep, content and at peace, I could have sworn I heard her whisper, I love you too.